If you have your Bibles with you, I'd ask you to turn to the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 16, and we're going to begin reading in the very first verse. Proverbs 16, in the very first verse. The Bible says, The preparation of the heart in man, and the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. For the ways of man are clean in his own eyes, but the Lord weigheth the spirits. Commit thy works unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. The Lord hath made all things for himself, yea, even the wicked for the day of evil. Everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Though, though hand join in hand, he shall not be punished. By mercy and truth, iniquity is, is purged. And by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. When a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with Him. Right. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank You for Your goodness and Your watch care. We thank You for Your mercy and grace that You show our church. Lord, we praise You for all that You do for us. Lord, now we pray that You would honor Your Word with Your Spirit. Lord, that You might uh, make it a living Word this morning, that it might speak life to someone and it might encourage us along the way. God, help us as a people to be faithful to Your Word, Lord, in the last day that uh, we wouldn't be compromisers, but rather that we'd be soldiers for You. Lord God, we pray that You would honor Your Word with Your Spirit, and we pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now, I'll be preaching this morning on pleasing the Lord Jesus Christ, pleasing God the Father, because many times I'm fearful that we, we get convincing of ourselves that being saved is pleasing enough. Uh, being one of the redeemed is adequate. But you know, uh, we as the Lord's people, uh, sometimes we're not pleasing. What we do is not, uh, is not a, a, a pleasing thing to the Lord. And we should always desire to please the Lord. It should always be in the forefront of our mind what we can do to please Him more. Now, in the first verse, the Bible says the preparation of the heart, uh, the preparations of the heart in man, and the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. Now, uh, that first word it says in the preparations, plural, of the heart. Now, uh, have you thought this morning what kind of preparations that you made to come to the house of the Lord this morning? And you might say, well, I got up and I showered and I dressed and I did that. But did you approach the Lord God? Did you, did you pray for me as your pastor? Did you pray for one another? Uh, you know, a lot of times the reason that we uh, get no more out of the service than we do is that we lack preparation. And uh, we live in a very busy time, and I understand that. Uh, but we should be always in a mind to prepare for the Lord. And, and He gives us some ideas how to accomplish that. Uh, verse 2 said, All the ways of, of man are clean in his own eyes. Now, uh, we think that what we do is adequate. That what we do is pretty good. But what we must realize is don't look at it in your way, but look at it in God's way. Uh, look at your service, uh, not as that you're doing Him a favor, but as an expectation, because He does. And all the ways, all the ways of man are clean in His own eyes, but the Lord weigheth the Spirit. Now that should be very humbling to us because, you know, uh, sometimes we look pretty good. We're faithful to church. We come when the door's open. We do this and we do that. But why did you come? He weighs the Spirit. Did you come to be seen? Did you come because you knew people would be uh, upset if you didn't? You know, if you came for any less than praising the Lord, there's a problem. That's right. Yeah. Now, um... This is the time we come to praise. Out there is service. This, this is, you know, this is the time we come to lift up His name and uh, and honor Him for who He is. And so, a lot of times I think it would do us well, and, and maybe we would praise Him more if we just waited. Hey, why am I even here? Verse three: Commit thy works unto the Lord. Now, 
The Bible has a great deal to say about works and working for the Lord. Uh, it's not for salvation. It's because He touched your life and made you whole and new. Uh, but I think sometimes we, uh, as the Lord's people, uh, we want to minimize works. But I want you to see here, we need to look at what we're doing and why we're doing it. Um, you can't really praise Him if you're not in the right frame of mind. If you've not come prepared, uh, you can't praise the Lord uh, as we should. And so, as Solomon is writing this, he, he wants to convey to his people to commit thy works unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. Now, sometimes I follow some things on Facebook, and I think they're kind of ridiculous much of the time. But uh, there's a group, and it's an increasing group of people that want to bring the law back into play. That you can do good enough to be redeemed, and you can be good enough to be uh, to do something marvelous and earn your way to salvation. Uh, nothing farther could be from the truth. Right. Listen, if works was the way, the prophets of old, you know, Christ would not even have to come if works was adequate, right? right? Why would He shed His life's blood? If the law was adequate, the Bible says in Colossians that uh, uh, Galatians simply that the law is our schoolmaster. It, it, it tells us what's wrong and what's needed, and, and so we see that if, if we're going to sincerely praise the Lord, and, and hopefully that is your idea, uh, you have to get down to where you think. You know, uh, doing things is adequate you, in, in man's eyes. You come to church, you do this, but what are your thoughts? You know, sometimes I, I truly tremble in fear thinking that the mighty God of heaven knows my thoughts. You know, that, that, that's, a very, that's a very humbling idea, isn't it? Mm -hmm. yeah. It is for me. You may, you may, uh, you may think, you know, he, the Bible says if you've done it in your heart, you've done it already. That's an humbling thing. You know, even that in itself would relinquish the law, would it not? That, that would mean that you're guilty. If you lust after a woman, you're guilty of adultery. If you get angry and say, I wish he was dead, you're guilty of murder. So we see then that as the Lord's, uh, as the Lord's people, we really need to get down and say, okay, why am I here? Am I here to praise the Lord or am I here for other reasons? Verse 4, the Lord had made all things for Himself. Now, uh, what a wonderful thought this is. You know, even, even the rocks that line the hills of Stewart County, God made those for Himself to be praiseworthy some way. The Cumberland River that flows through Stewart County is His workmanship, and He did that to praise Himself. He made me to praise Himself. And you know, it even says in the next sentence, even the vessels of wrath are for His praise. Hitler rose up and lived and died for the praise of Almighty God. That, that's hard to believe when you think how evil he was and how malicious he was. But the Bible says, and see, that's the God we serve. He's not trying to accomplish things. He does things. He's not wringing his hands hoping things will work out. But rather, he knows they will. Even the wicked for the day of evil. The wicked that rose up. Listen, it was all under the mighty hand of God. That's a reason to praise Him. Verse 5, Everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Now, what's your pride? What's your pride as a servant? What's your pride on the job place? What's your pride as a preacher? Uh, we had, you know, when, when it gets back to grace, none of us have anything to be prideful of. Is that not right? When, when you think He saved you because it's His goodness and mercy plus nothing, minus nothing, uh, that, that there, there's no room for pride in that. When you think that you are well deserving to go to hell, you don't leave any room for pride, does it? Right. That He came to you and saved your never dying soul and didn't have to. Didn't have to. He's not obligated to save anybody. Yeah. But he did. And that will make us want that that'll make us thrill. It, it sets all the room uh, it, it gets a, all, rid of all pride completely and, and forever when we think that he did it all. Verse 6. Uh, by mercy and truth, iniquity is purged. 
Now, if you write in your Bible, I want you to underline that one by by because because we will see exactly what is what it means by mercy and truth. Iniquity is purged. Now, uh, mercy is uh, is this. It's almost as good as grace. It's God speaking to His people and being compassionate. Now, truth is a different matter. Truth is hard. Um, you know, truth is one of those things a lot of times we don't like to hear. Like, you know, when your wife comes in and says, how's this dress? And you have a choice to tell her the truth or not, right? And the truth's not always pleasant. You know, you can try, well, I'd wear something else. And uh, that's, kind of telling, that's kind of telling the truth, right? Uh, but the Lord... The Lord is very different in that, and, and we live we live in a day where truth is not is not pleasant to most people. Uh, the truth is this: there's nothing you can do in of yourself to be saved. Nothing whatsoever. That's the truth. And in the modern day, that's not pleasant truth, but it is the truth. Uh, the man that fell among thieves, did he cry out for help? Bible doesn't say that, right? The law, the self-righteous priest came by and passed him on the other side. He couldn't touch him. He couldn't do nothing for him. And, and, and then we find the half-breed Samaritan, which is a type of Christ, fully man and fully God, comes down and, and picks him up, does everything for him. He carries him into the place. He couldn't even walk. See, that, 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 that's where we are. That is the desperateness of salvation. And so when we get to the truth of the matter, the truth is this, we need the Lord Jesus Christ. The truth is this, there's nothing that, if Christ doesn't intervene, there's no hope for you. The truth is that it's all of Christ. The truth is, is He is high and lifted up. That's the truth. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we don't need, to, you know, th this is the thing. And when I used to teach, uh, I always told my students, Unless you want to know the truth, don't ask me. But if you want to know the truth, I'll tell you. Came out of all the patients' room and, uh, Mr. Blackford, do you think they're going to make it? No. And, you know, they look pretty bleak and look pretty discouraged, but they asked me, right? See, that book will tell you the truth. It's not always pleasant, but it will tell you the truth. If you want to know ma about man and man's nature, read Romans chapter 3 and you'll find all that you want to know about the, day, the nature of man. And that is the truth. And, and, and the truth is not always pleasant, but the truth is always good. And then in John 1, He comes and says, I am the truth. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by Me. Not by baptism, not by good works, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. That's a wonderful truth. It is a glorious thing that it doesn't depend on us. Verse 7, When a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh any, even his enemies to be at peace with him. When a man's ways please the Lord. Now, that's really what we want to look at this morning is look at our life and do we really please the Lord? Not please wife and not please husband. <coughs> Excuse me. Not pleasing the work person, but do you please the Lord? Uh, really, that's all that there is in this life, is it not? That this life, if we live a hundred years, it's just a dressing room for eternity. And, and so do you please the Lord? That, that, that is a question that we must ask ourselves. And I have to say, frequently, I would have to say no. Yeah. My thoughts do not please the Lord. My actions don't always please the Lord. The way that I address people doesn't always please the Lord. So it ought to be the desire of every believer's heart is that they would really be pleasing to the Lord and that what they did would accomplish something to His glory. Now, I want to go over to 1 Kings uh, a, little, a little further back. Uh, fairly familiar verses of Scripture, but I want to read them in your hearing. 
uh, uh, 1 Kings chapter number 3. Uh, Solomon is fixing to take the throne. Uh, 1 Kings chapter 3. King David has died. And uh, Solomon was very, very young when his dad died. Probably about 12. And he was going to ascend the throne of Israel. And very, very huge undertaking. 1 Kings 3. Uh, 1 Kings 3. Uh, verse 3, the Bible says, And Solomon loved the Lord. And Solomon loved the Lord. Listen, if you love the Lord, it will impact your life. Uh, see, when you love someone or something, you'll do things that you ordinarily wouldn't do. Uh, I love my wife. We've been together 29 years yesterday. And you know what's keep us going at times? Just the very fact that she loves me and I love her because that's pretty much all that we have. And when you love the Lord, it will impact what you do. And you know what? If it doesn't, probably you don't really love it. If you say you love the Lord and you don't find yourself in the house of the Lord, you probably really don't love it. If you say you love the Lord and you turn around and blaspheme His name, you probably really don't love Him. You see, and, and so we see that the reason that, uh, that Solomon served Him, it simply states this, and Solomon loved the Lord walking in the statutes of David his father. You see, because he loved the Lord, it impacted his life. He walked after David. He, he did things daily just like David did because he loved the Lord. Only in sacrifice and burnt incense, only he sacrificed and burnt incense in high places. Now, later on we'll find in Solomon's old age he was somewhat led astray, but don't get these confused with the high places like the Druids had because that was around Jerusalem worshiping trees and stuff. But what it's saying, and it makes it a little clearer in a minute, instead of going down to the tabernacle and burning, he would go up on the mountains and offer his sacrifices there. And we'll find in a moment the Lord met with him. So what the real thing is, is that he worshipped the Lord. So one thing that we find, if you love Him, you'll worship Him. And if you don't, you won't. Yeah. Very simple, right? And if you love Him, you'll worship Him, and it'll impact your life, and if you don't, certainly you won't worship Him, you won't serve Him in any way. And so... Uh, in verse 4, and the king went to, to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was a great high place. Again, the higher the better in their mind. A thousand burnt offerings did Solomon offer upon the altar. Now, so he goes to Gibeon. He, there's this huge place to offer unto the Lord there. And it says there he offered a thousand whatevers. If they were bullocks, or if they were lambs, or if they were goats, I have no idea. It doesn't say. It said that he made a thousand offerings. You know, that's a, in addition to a great expense, that's a lot of work. Uh, I, I, I never... I've never butchered much things, but it's a lot of work. I've butchered some chicken. That's a lot of work. A lot of bloody stuff. A lot of cleaning up. But the reason he did it and motivated him is because he loved the Lord. See, love will impact what you do. It, it'll impact your expenditures. And I don't just mean money. Where, where are you going to spend your time? What are you going to do with your energies? What's your leisure time about? Is it spent in prayer or sucked up by sports? See, what, 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 what does your time consist of? And that's really, really uh, was no, no issue for Solomon. He loved the Lord so much, he bore the expense of whatever these sacrifices were about. In verse 5 it says, In Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon. Now, did, did you get that? Because of his commitment to the Lord and his ability to sacrifice, his desire, then the Lord met with him. You know what? Uh, this is the news flash in the modern day. The Lord's not obligated to meet with you. 
Just because you come together and have a meeting and there's good preaching, God don't have to show up. But that's why when He does, we ought to give Him praise. When, when He begins to move and work in His service, we ought to lift up His name and say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, because He don't have to show up. You know, in other words, Solomon could have done all that thousand of thousand whatevers that he sacrificed, and God didn't show up because He wasn't an obligation to him. Don't you ever believe that God's obligated to do anything? The Bible says He does what sinneth good unto Himself. Mm-hmm. And, and, and so we see then, uh, uh, Solomon did it, and the Lord in His mercy responded. In, in Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I shall give thee. Now what a what a unbelievable documentation. I can't imagine the Lord God speaking to me and saying, What do you want? Ask what I'll give you. You, 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 you name it, you've got it. You, you, you request it and it's yours. And you know what? It would be a very easy way to get carnal and to get fleshly and say, Listen, I'd like to have millions of dollars. I, I'd like to have this, you know. I'd like to have that. Um, my, uh, something I've wanted since I was 12 years old is a 1953 Chevy truck. And it would have been easy to say, you know, that's what I want. Um, so, it, I think in service to the Lord then, what do you want? Do you want to serve Him? Or do you want something different? Yeah. Mm-hmm. See, a lot of times we're satisfied with entertainment, ain't we? Mm-hmm. Just whatever's going on. And, and, and so we see that as the Lord's people that we should be like Solomon and, and have a desire like him. Notice what he says. And Solomon said, Thou hast shown unto thy servant David, my father, great mercy, according as he walked before thee in truth and in righteousness and in uprightness of heart with thee. Thou hast kept for him, for him this great kindness that thou hast given him a son to sit on his throne. Now, I want you to see that that in, in his response, Solomon remembers his father. And you can read that and see what, an, what a wonderful example that David left behind. Now fathers, you're leaving some type of example behind. Whether it be good or whether it be bad, whatever it is, you're leaving some kind of example behind on a routine basis. You know what? Uh, I have very little, very little uh, uh, respect for a man that will walk off and leave a family. Yeah. I really don't. Uh, you know, uh, I struggled with that for years with my own dad, trying to find in my heart to respect him. Uh, but the Bible does say this and gives no qualifications honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment of promise, that it may be well with thee, and that thy days may be long upon the earth. And really that's the only that that's the that's the nutshell. But you see, David left the testimony behind for Solomon. And we leave some kind of testimony behind, whether good or whether bad. And our, listen, them, them little children, even my youngest granddaughter, uh, Abigail, she, she sucks that stuff up on a routine basis. Don't think that it's being passed over by your children and your grandchildren. They are watching you. And we see here, Solomon only had 12 years. And really, you know, the time you have a good memory, I remember sometimes some bad things when I was three. By four, my memory's working pretty good. So he only really had eight years to impact the life of his son, and he was gone. And, and so whatever, whatever we have, we are impacting our kids. Then he says in verse 7, And now, O Lord my God, Thou hast made thy servant king instead of David my father. And I am but a little child. I know not how to go or out or come in. Now you talk about admitting your your faults. He did. You know, uh, I met some I've met some twelve year old kids, the only thing I think is they needed a good whipping. Right? Yeah. And you have a young child king taking the throne of one of the most mighty nations in the world at that time. 
And he understood the responsibility of it. And if you're saved this morning, do you realize the responsibility that you have? You have the responsibility to share the gospel. You have the responsibility to live a life that's well-pleasing unto the Lord. You have the responsibility to be in the Lord's house on the Lord's day. That is a responsibility that we, each and every one of us, share. And so I want you to see that David understood that. Verse 8, And thy servant is in the midst of thy people which thou hast chosen, a great people that cannot be numbered nor counted for multitude. Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people, and that I may discern between good and bad. For who is able to judge this thy, thy so great a people? And the speech pleased the Lord. And Solomon, that Solomon had asked this thing. So we find that the way that Solomon <clears throat> pleased the Lord was really twofold. Number one, he was humble. He admitted his circumstance for what it was. He was on. You know what? The very best thing that you can ever do is just say, "Hey, I, I know I'm useless, but use me anyway." He admitted his circumstance, and then he said, "Would you just please give me some wisdom that I can make the right decision as I leave this huge nation? I just want some wisdom." And the Bible says that what he said pleased the Lord. And you know what? We we ought to be we ought to be like that. Uh, what we say, what he said, his prayer, but just the way that he said it pleased the Lord. Now, uh, a lot of times, sometimes I find myself in, in, encroached on that uh, and, and not doing such a good job because sometimes it's not so bad what I say, but how I say it. You know, I, I tell this story, and nowadays I probably couldn't do it. But a girl was disrespectful me, to me in class, and I said, get your stuff out together and get out of my classroom. That wasn't the best way to say that, was it? Now I was angry and mad, and that's how it came up. But I can be just as well, Miss So-and-so, get your things, class is dismissed for you. Send her away. You see, uh, what we say and how we say it is huge. It can bring praise and glory and honor to the Lord, or it can bring it can bring people down. It can uh, discourage people. Uh, what I want to do is that my speech might praise Him, that might lift Him up, not bring Him down and, and, and not stomp Him out, but be well pleasing to the Lord. So the things we say and how we say them, the way that we present them, it needs to be pleasing to the Lord. And that is everything that's to be done should be praiseworthy to Him should lift him up. And so the first thing that we can play, praise the Lord or please the Lord, please Him, is huh, the things we say. Uh, are, are they pleasing to the Lord in how He said them? Uh, the book of Psalms, go back over there. Psalm 69. We find that David understands praise probably better than anybody uh, Psalm 69, verse 29. Psalm 69, uh, verse 29. The Bible says, But I am poor and sorrowful. Let thy salvation, O God, set me on high. Now, see, uh, David had gotten discouraged. And if you have not had these seasons of discouragement, you will. There'll be events in your life. There'll be things. He, and listen, what, what was really happening in this portion of his history is Absalom, his son, was in full rebellion to him. You know what? Uh, I, I, I praise the Lord. I have never had my children do this. We had a little problem with that. But thankfully it was limited. But you're talking about somebody literally leading the army against you. Wanted to dethrone you. In fact, David had to run. And in this in this season, he says, I, "I'm discouraged. I can't do anymore." And listen, uh, it is very hard. It, it is a very difficult difficult thing when you come down and try to please the Lord in this situation. 
Uh, to, to, give him, uh, to give him praise as we should, to lift him up. And so he says, But I am poor and sorrowful. Let thy salvation, O Lord, set me on high. I will praise the name of God with a song. Now, uh, another way that we can praise Him in our prayer life and in what we do uh, is, is singing unto the Lord. Now, when we think about that, we always want something that sounds good, right? Uh, what that is, it just tickles the flesh. Now, uh, back in the day, I don't like them anymore because they've got worldly on me. But I used to love the Kingsmen. They can sing. You know, a lot of times that's nothing any more than just flesh. I, 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 and I don't really agree with the principles of the song, but it left a, a lasting message in my mind. I was probably nine, eight or nine years old. And there was a woman down there at Carlisle where I, I, I grew up. Her name, we called her Aunt Lily. And she wasn't our aunt, she wasn't anybody's aunt, but she was an old lady. And we just, everybody called her Aunt Lily. And probably whenever I remember her, if I was nine, that would have been in the mid-70s, uh, late 70s, and she was in her 90s then. So you're talking about a woman uh, that was born probably in the 1880s, 1870s, late 1870s, along in there. And uh, she uh, got up in, in the church, and again, I didn't, I didn't recognize... Uh, I, I didn't like the principle of the song nowadays, but y'all remember that old song, I'm Building a Bridge? And again, I didn't, like the, I didn't like the principle of the song, but she got up and she croaked that thing out. And y'all think I sing bad. Uh, Aunt Lily just didn't have the voice, but she was praising her Lord. Man. And when, when she got done, they went to dry in the place. Because, not because she was such a wonderful singer. She was praising her Lord. And you could tell, you could tell just by what she was doing. It, it, it wasn't for somebody to see her. It wasn't for somebody to be impressed with her vocal ability. She just praised the Lord. So, we can, we can praise Him and give Him great glory in prayer. And we can praise Him and give Him great glory in song. Now, just one more thing about prayer. Making an exhortation. Uh, Bible says He knows what things you have need of. So, don't, don't approach Him with a give me, give me, give me. My name's Jimmy. You approach Him with praise. The magnificent Creator of all the universe. Blessed and holy be Thy wonderful name. And see, He's pleased with that. He's, he, he's lifted up when we praise Him. So we can praise Him, and we can praise Him with song. We can lift up His name this way. Uh, I will praise the name of God with a song, and will magnify Him with thanksgiving. Now, are you thankful for what you have? Are you, are you praiseworthy? Uh, I, I think I'm getting a lot closer to hip replacement on this right side. I'm going to see if Dr. Levin can do something for me before I take it to that extreme. But uh, I got up this morning and this hip was about to kill me. And uh, I wanted to grumble at first. And uh, I got, I got, I did a little work on my sermon, you know, get things finished up with that. And I walked up to the barn, and I got to thinking about this. And all y'all know our place knows the barn's on top of the hill. I was able to walk up that hill. It hurt a little bit, but I was able to get up there. That's something to praise the Lord for. There are a lot of people this morning that couldn't get up. That was confined to their bed. That they had to wait around on somebody else to come by, and when they got ready, get them up. Could you imagine living like that? That's something to praise the Lord for. I, I'm up and I'm about and I'm moving around and I got a voice. That's something to praise God for. Uh, lift up His name and, and, and give Him great song. That, that's what we as the Lord's people need to do is to be singing from the Spirit. Verse 31 says, This also shall please the Lord better than ox or bullock that have horns and hooves. In other words, instead of 
uh, sacrifice, instead of the Ju Judean sacrifice laws, what, what he's pleased with is to be lifted up in song and praised in thanksgiving that he gave me breath of life. Another day I'm up, uh, walking above the sod and I give him praise. That's better than a thousand burnt offerings. And so we as the Lord's people, uh, we need to do that. Right. Every opportunity that we have. And I'll go even further and we will move on to has praise and songs that praise. Watch what you listen to. Mm -hmm. There are songs in my head that I would to God I could get out. And listen, I haven't listened to trash like that in almost 30 years. And I'll be going down the road to see some patient and uh, the next thing I know I'm singing something about by Bonnie Tyler. And if you don't know her, you're better off for it. Remember Total Eclipse of the Heart? Millie does. She's going on last one right here. But you see what I'm saying? We need to praise Him with song. We need to praise Him with our heart. And, 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 and lift Him up for who, for who He is. And so, praise Him with, with song. Lift Him up as you should. Go me to 1 Corinthians and we bring it down to a New Testament. <coughs> 1 Corinthians chapter 7. I just want to read verse 22 for time's sake. Uh, 1 Corinthians 7. Sorry, that's not the verse I wanted. Oops. Go with me to uh, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. First Thessalonians chapter 4. Uh, I'm going to read just the, verse, the first verse of that chapter. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. For the more... Then, furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus that, that that as you have received of us how you ought to walk and to please God, so you would abound more and more. Now, the next thing that um, that we need to pre please the Lord with is our walk. Now. Uh, when when I say walk, I don't mean our gait and how we get about and if we're in a wheelchair or if we can run a road or whatever. But what what do you do? If I went over to the factory across the street and they didn't know me and I said, tell me about Justin Lang. What would they say? Right? If I went down to train company in Clarksville and said, uh, I need to know everything you know about Terry Lackey, what, what would they tell me? Because that, that's hugely important, is it not? That, that is our walk. And it can be praiseworthy or it can, or, or it can, or it can bring a, a detriment to the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. If I went down to train and uh, they said, well, uh, Terry's here, but that's about all you can say about him. Every time I look for him, I can't find him anywhere. And when you do find him, he's out there eating something. We can't get no work out of Terry. What would that say about him? And more important, what would it say about the Lord Jesus Christ? Now, all you know, Terry, is probably tenfold the opposite. And that's a good testimony. Uh, I was, uh, Friday, I had, uh, I had, I had, all my patients were here in Dover, and one of the nurses, the other nurses got into some trouble, and she was really, really behind, and I said, I just sent her a text, you know, that's the only way we can communicate these days, you have to tell, you can't speak to people anymore. <laughs> and, uh, uh, so I sent her a text and said, who do you want me to see? And so she told me about this patient up by exit one. And I said, well, I'll see you for you. And my boss was just blown away. And I was like, you know, that's just normal courtesy. I'm like, you know, Betsy's in trouble. Go, go help her. 
You know, isn't it a sad thing that something that common and should be routine is impressive? That's the day we live, but what, what, what testimony, when they say, how are you walking, what do they say? You're known by what you do, whether good or bad, and, and whether that's genuine or not. I can't look into Jesse's heart and say, oh man, she's, she's just filled with love. I can tell that. But I do know this. She takes good care of my granddaughter. I do know this. She respects my son. Uh, I know only about her walk, right? And so that's really how people know you. And, and so we as the Lord's people, if we want to be praiseworthy and, and we, we want to lift Him up and we want to honor Him as we should, that, that, that it always has to be in the back of our mind and, and, uh, uh, <laughs> and uh, impact everything, everything that we do. It should, be, it should be in the back of our mind, this is how I'm going to present to others. Go with me to the book of Colossians. Colossians chapter number 1. Colossians 1, and we're going to begin uh, reading in verse 7. Colossians 1, in verse 7, the Bible says, As you also learned of Ephoras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, who declared unto us your love in the Spirit, for this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray, to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and understanding. And, and so another way that we can praise Him, huh, that we can lift Him up and that we can honor Him for who He is, is just to pray for one another. Have, have you prayed for me today? Uh, that's a really good question. And you look back across the room and, and you look at uh, the different individuals and uh, have I prayed for Matt and Dessa and the baby? Have I prayed for Eric? I like to say the really only one that I can say that I prayed for truly and, and, and just sincerely mean that I, you know, and, and, and you know we all have those generic prayers. Bless the church. And that's three words. <laughs> But Eric was a little late. I thought, wait a minute, I hope he's all right. Uh, you know, somebody that lives by themselves, you, you worry a little bit. And I guess it's because I, you know, I don't know that old age creeping on the right. I'm like, well, well, he's got to, you know, can get down to the basement all right. And, you know, he lives by himself and, you know, on and on. And so I just prayed for him. Uh, it, it wasn't long, he came in. But that that is well pleasing to the Lord. And not that I did it. I would just say, instead of putting people down, won't you try praying for them? Amen. And listen, you're going to have people, and I don't care how saintly you are, that just rub you the wrong way. And the best advice I can give you is to pray for them. I, I, I've had, when I taught, I had students come to the room and I thought, gee, I'm not going to like you. <laughs> uh, uh, Best thing I could do is to pray for them. And, 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 and pray for me that you know my attitude might be changed a little bit. I, I don't know this person from Adam. So maybe, maybe they're going to be the most uh, encouraging student I ever had. Now, I did not have that experience. I was always right. <laughs> but uh, you never know. And, and so we as, we as Lord's people, we need to praise Him and to lift Him up and to honor Him and all in everything that we do. Now, one more place. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 20. Just a little bit further over uh, in that book. Uh, children, obey your parents in the Lord. Uh, obey your parents in all things, for this is well pleasing unto the Lord. Yeah. Now, you want to please Him and praise Him and lift Him up? Obey your parents. Now, uh, I'm blessed enough to still have my mom. She's 81 years old. And it can be difficult. Uh, I told y'all last week about the last time she got out of the hospital, 
we sat there and I was trying to help her and she goes, I just need to see a nurse. Mm-hmm. Okay, mom. Uh, and I'm like, I guess I'm chocolate. liver. But then I got to thinking, I'll always be her boy. And uh, the fact that I am a nurse don't really always mean a whole lot to her. Uh, I'm the honor her. I want to be well pleasing to the Lord. I don't trash her around. I want to be pleasing to the Lord if she calls me and says, Larry, will you come? I go. Uh, that, 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 that's pleasing to the Lord. And it doesn't ever qualify if you've got a good daddy, if you've got a bad daddy, you got a sweet mama, you got a mean mama. It just says to honor them. And, and that's what we are to do. So I often wonder how pleasing our actions are to the Lord. Because see, what really that gets down to is praise. If if we're pleasing to Him, we're praising Him. And if we're not pleasing to Him, we're not. We're not lifting up any kind of praise whatsoever. So, uh, you know, don't ever let the umbrella of grace make you think that you can treat anybody any way that you wish to. Because it's not pleasing to the Lord. Right. Are, are you pleasing to Him this morning? Are you are, are, are you walking in fellowship with Him? Or do 